Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a very exciting session on a very hot topic. Uh, and welcome to the Consumers International Fair Digital Forum session on Buy Now, Pay Later Services. I'm your host, Lisa Gill. I am an investigative reporter at Consumer Reports here in the United States. Uh, Consumer Reports is an independent, nonprofit consumer organization based out of Yonkers, New York. I have been at Consumer Reports for over a decade covering all kinds of healthcare topics and cost topics, including credit reports, credit scores, and how to fix them, how to make them better. And this topic has come across my desk and we are looking at it very closely and we are very excited about today's discussion. So I have the pleasure of moderating uh, the discussion um, about Pi Now Pay Later and the consumer experience. And I would love to just give you two quick um, housekeeping items here. So definitely, if you can see it, use the chat function to add comments and Q&A for any of the panelists as we go along here. These panelists have got really rich backgrounds. They're coming from three points across the globe uh, to share what they've been studying and what they're seeing uh, in their neck of the woods. And it's, it's important, good stuff. So when also feel free to use the chat function to introduce yourselves, uh, which organization you're from, your name, and where you are chatting us from. So. With that in mind, I would love to introduce our panelists today. We are joined by some excellent, excellent uh, people here with really deep insights, deep backgrounds into buy now, pay later topics. And we are looking forward to what they're gonna share with us today. So um, the first person, uh, one of our esteemed guests is Chris Woolard. He is chair of the EY Global Regulatory Network and former chief executive of the UK's Financial Conduct Authority. Also joining us is Kelly Cochran. She is the Deputy Director of FinReg Lab here in the US. And Alan Kirkland, he is CEO of Choice. He is part of Australia's largest consumer organization. And I love pointing out that it's really early for Alan tomorrow morning, and it's really late in the evening for all of our UK panelists. So thank you everyone for joining us from across the globe. Also, another very important item after looking here at our panelists, I would love to mention that this is sort of a formal announcement, but it's an important one. And it's that today, Consumer Reports is joining with other consumer advocacy organizations who have signed on to something that's called the Global Consumer Statement on Buy Now, Pay Later. And this is important. And this statement outlines key protections that we feel are needed to ensure that these payment services are safe and fair to use for consumers. And we're going to explore those reforms in much more detail later in the conversation with our panelists, but I wanted to let you all know ahead of time. And I'm going to just jump right in, and I'm, I'm seeing some great uh, chats coming across uh, the wire here, which I thank you for uh, introducing yourselves. It's really, it's a pleasure. That you all are here. Um, I'm, I'm tasked with starting out with like the really basic stuff about what is buy now, pay later. Um, for some of you around parts of the world, this is not necessarily a new concept, but it is here kind of in the United States. So buy now, pay later products, what they do is essentially extend credit to consumers to pay for goods and services over time. And buy now, pay later providers, these companies, uh, typically cover the cost of goods and services up front and then ask the consumer to pay them back in installments. And sort of like a credit card, but sort of not. And one really interesting thing is that how do these companies make money? And it's in two key ways. One is they charge businesses that use their services for the pleasure of using them or for the benefit of offering them. And then they also charge late fees to consumers who don't pay their installment payment on time. They, the buy now pay services have become much more popular um, since a company called Afterplay was first introduced in Australia in 2014. And it has seen a really rapid growth since then in a lot of other countries, uh, along with the United States, but it also includes Sweden, Germany, Finland, the UK, and obviously here. Um, and one really interesting thing is that the, the COVID-19 pandemic really intensified their use uh, for a couple of reasons. We think more people are obviously quarantining at home and they're shopping online and they are getting exposed 
to the potential or you know the, the service itself and are taking advantage of it. In fact, so many people have been using them here in the United States that Consumer Reports did a recent nationally representative survey of people who have used buy now, pay later services. And we had some pretty interesting findings that are definitely worth sharing here. So we learned that more than half, so it's 55% of Americans who did use a buy now, pay later service, um, basically said that they did that instead of paying by credit card um, because they'd rather just pay a few set installments instead of paying in one lump sum. Another reason that people use buy now, pay later services is because they just said they didn't have enough money to pay for the good or service that they wanted. I guess that's not too surprising, but still 47% is pretty high. Um, also, the consumers told us, 24% of consumers who used a buy now, pay later service told us that they used it because they thought that the interest rate on these services would actually be cheaper than using a credit card. And 20% said they thought it would be easier than a credit card. And then a whopping 12% told us that they used a buy now, pay later service because they just didn't have a credit card at all. Now, for, for the next slide, please. Interestingly, 80% of people who do use a buy now, pay later service here in the United States told us they didn't have a problem using it. In fact, they were kind of happy with the service. They said it was convenient and it was easy to use without interest if you're organizing, if you can make your payments on time. But the real downside is that 20% of people who do, who have used these services did report some kind of problem. And one, probably not too surprising, but interesting, uh, is that people who use these made purchases that they later regretted, uh, that they basically impulse buy. So they buy, you know, maybe more than what they can afford. Um, also, people were upset because they were charged late fees for late payments. And some people told us that they had difficulty trying to deal with getting items, you know, like returning an item or just dealing with customer service if they were unhappy with the purchase. So that's what's going on here in the US. Um, and sorry, I'm looking at my notes, which are extensive. We, as I mentioned, we have signed on to the global consumer statement on buy now, pay later. And we are gonna talk about these reforms in much greater detail as we continue our session. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Chris Wooler, who's got some really, really remarkable information to share with us as part of the Willard Review um, and to give us a more detailed look at what's going on in the UK and what reforms are being introduced. So Chris, thank you so much for coming today and thank you for sharing with us. Excellent. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so good afternoon or good evening or good morning, uh, depending on where you are uh, in the world at the moment. Um, as Lisa said, I'm Chris Willard. Uh, I'm a partner at EY. I'm also a trustee of WICH, which is the Consumer Association in the UK. Uh, I'm not speaking in either of those capacities today. So these are some sort of personal comments. And they're based on being chair of uh, the Woolard Review uh, last year and, and in late 2020. It does, by the way, sound really weird to call it the Woolard Review. It is, it's as if you're talking about yourself in the third person. Um, but this was essentially a review set up by uh, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK with uh, help from the government to look at innovation in the unsecured credit market as a whole. Um, so 26 recommendations made in sort of five groups across the whole of the, the credit market. But in particular, one thing I think stood out because of the massive growth that had been seen in the UK very rapidly around buy now, pay later. So this went in a space of about 12 months from having virtually no customers to having well over 5 million customers and now probably six or 7 million active users. So about one in 10 adults uh, in the UK regularly using buy now, pay later um, as customers of it. So what I wanted to do is to try and talk through some of the key findings just as apply to uh, BMPL and, and then where uh, we're going in terms of that market. So if I could have the next slide, uh, please. So um, the first finding, and this might be a little bit surprising, although it's completely consistent with the, with the data that Lisa just shared, is that of course, buy now, pay later can be a good alternative to other forms of credit. So whether that's borrowing against a credit card, where typically 
in the UK market, you'll see APRs of about 29, 30%, uh, or whether that's um, uh, against things like payday lending, where you can still see very, very high triple or even quadruple figures of interest around those. Um, buy now, pay later to the consumer, to the consumer who pays back on time, offers a, basically an interest-free credit option uh, for dealing with uh, purchases day to day. However, it does come with a number of drawbacks. I think first and foremost of those is the lack of affordability checks. So when we looked at the customers of a major UK bank uh, during the review, one in 10 of those customers who took buy now, pay later for the first time were already in arrears. And those sorts of things are normally caught by uh, standard credit checks and standard affordability checks that you would get in a regulated product. Second thing was uh, the ability to create higher levels of indebtedness. I think often in this debate, people talk about buying a pair of shoes or buying a pair of jeans and it being quite a small ticket price against that. And there are lots of transactions like that. But there are also a considerable number of consumers that we found who will max out their limits with one buy now, pay later provider, then move on to the next, then move on to the next, then move on to the next. And that information, because of that lack of affordability checks, is, is, is invisible both to other buy now, pay later firms and also the wider credit market. And so you can have people quickly acquiring sums of around £1,000 of debt, which when you look at the average incomes of some of the people we're talking about, it, it's in, often trending towards a range of around 16,000 a year. So those are you know, quite high levels of indebtedness quite quickly. Then we also found in the review that there was poor consumer understanding of the product. Um, quite a lot of people didn't even realize it was credit, which I think was one of the most surprising findings out of the review. It was confused with uh, pay now type buttons uh, that you might see on uh, products like Amazon and those kinds of things. Um, buy now, pay later was also often presented almost as a default payment method. You had to sort of have several clicks to actually get to pay by a debit card or a credit card that you might be just paying off normally. Um, there was also a lack of clarity in terms of that how customers would be treated if they didn't repay on time. So would there be late fees? Would there be reporting to credit reference agencies? Those kinds of things. And also if things go wrong, uh, consumers assume because this was a financial service, they would have some rights. They would be able to, for example, go to the ombudsman, but absolutely that's not the case at all because it's an unregulated product. And then finally, that lack of transparency around affordability also creates uh, potential issues for the wider credit market. So for example, lenders who are regulated, who are making decisions, can't necessarily see that borrowing uh, that, that, that people are already taking on uh, buy now, pay later. And so the conclusion of, of the review was that uh, this needed to be bought urgently within regulation. And, and to their credit, I mean, the government acted incredibly quickly. Um, enabling legislation uh, was passed within six weeks. Uh, since then, the Treasury has been somewhat slower, but it's been dealing with a whole range of other things. Uh, but it has just finished a consultation on new regulatory powers in the UK. And those would be to bring buy now, pay later within regulation by the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, the, the FCA would have its normal powers, so all the normal powers around affordability and, and uh, marketing, for example, of products uh, would apply. There are some adaptations uh, to the Consumer Credit Act, which requires very detailed disclosure requirements to consumers taking on a loan. Uh, so this would mean that it would fit far more on the on the, on, the, on the front of a mobile phone, when, which is where a lot of this credit's taken out. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty sensible reform. There would also be some possible adaptation uh, to make it easier for retailers to actually comply uh, because there are very, very wide networks now of quite small businesses using BMPL uh, in the UK, which again, I think is, is on balance broadly sensible. So, so there's a package of measures there. We're still waiting for some final news from the government uh, but I would expect the FCA to be given powers uh, later this year. Thanks, Lisa. It's like no matter how many Zoom calls that you're on, you always forget to unmute, or I do. <laughs> Chris, that was 
really insightful. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. I, you said something that really was ringing a bell here um, in the US on payments. And that is, you know, when you come to the payment screen, those buy now pay later services show up just like they do with credit cards. And it might even be a little easier to use them. And a consumer could pretty easily confuse, I would say, those services with a credit card. And that takes us to the first question to Kelly about how do buy now pay later services affect a person's credit report and possibly their credit score? You know, how, how are these how are these services sort of seen um, by credit reports and why is it good or bad? Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, we're, um, thanks so much for including us in this. Um, we're focused on the use of data and technology with a particular lens towards financial inclusion. And with in the US in particular, I think there's some debate going on right now about how buy, buy now pay later potentially affect financial inclusion. We're seeing a lot of the credit reporting agencies changing their positions and kind of approaches to this data stream. And so we've been digging in to make sure we understand what's happening. I think there are a couple of different things that are really important for consumers to consider in this space. The general rule for most of these products is that they are not usually reported to credit bureaus in the way that other kind of more traditional credit products are unless the consumer goes late, in which case they are far more likely to be reported, although even then it does not always happen. So I think the first concern for consumers, especially if they don't really think about this as a form of credit, is that they may just not be thinking about the fact that there is some downside risk to their credit reports and their credit scores if they don't make the payments on time. And particularly in situations where consumers may be layering on a lot of these products on top of each other, if they lose track of something, you can potentially have problems where you are starting to see some delinquencies on reports. Um, oh, sorry, did you? Well, I've got, yeah, I've got, I have to jump in and just ask you this question that's yeah. off script, but I think it's pertinent. And that is, you know, when, when somebody doesn't, you know, they make a late payment, right? Um, mm. And maybe, or they don't, they skip a payment altogether for whatever reason and something does actually go to collections you know my impression is, is that from a credit report standpoint you know that is a ding on your credit report that can be huge and whether it's a 10 I mean not you know whether it's a ten dollar item that's in collections a hundred or a thousand dollar it won't it won't necessarily matter it's the fact that something did go into collections and it can really destroy your credit it if really depends. It can. It really depends on where the consumer's credit is to begin with. If you already have a, a credit record that has some delinquencies on it, it actually, frankly, will probably have less effect than on whether you have a really pristine credit record that doesn't show any of the delinquencies. So it depends a little bit on the consumer circumstances. But there's no question it can have a big effect. And I think one of the other things that's challenging about this space is there aren't a lot of really standardized procedures yet. Many of these products may be um, requiring consumer payments every two weeks. Well, at least in the US, most credit products are really thought of in a monthly cycle. And so what happens if a consumer goes delinquent and one payment catches back up? Like the, there's not a real standardized way of dealing with that within the industry. So, um, so there's a risk that just inconsistent practice practices can kind of muddy the waters and, and lead to different results for consumers who are actually similarly situated. I think a second set of concerns is that, um, uh, as I said, at least in the US, there's some interest in thinking about this as potentially a credit building opportunity. But what we're finding as we probe that is it really depends a lot on um, some lenders are, are reporting, but not all. And exactly how that reporting happens can make a big difference. And again, standards are a really important question. So uh, if the lender is making a hard inquiry up front, that can affect a, potentially affect a consumer's credit score. Sure. That's not very common in the industry in most areas, but it can, in some, some providers may do that. And so that may not be something consumers are expecting. And then on the back end where they are reporting, even on time payments, things like, is this reported as an open end line of credit or a closed end product where each loan is a separate trade line could have a potential impact? Is there an opening date on the, you know, listed for the account? Um, how do the delinquencies situations work? How do utilization rates get calculated with these That's kinds right. of products? All of these kinds of things can potentially in fact affect 
consumer scores. And so while there may be situations where even if a consumer has positive payments history, they are making everything on time, the results on their scores aren't necessarily what they're expecting. And so you know, that can be really important. And, you know, certain credit scoring models, for instance, won't consider, you know, unless you have a line, uh, uh, a credit account has been open a certain amount of time. So if these are really short-term products, again, is it is each loan reported separately or is it reported kind of as more of an ongoing open-end relationship? So all of those kinds of questions can come into play. And we're just so early in the process and this is expanding so quickly that I think there are a lot of questions that have to get sorted out as between the lenders, the credit reporting agencies, model builders, and then the users of the credit scores in terms of thinking about what's happening. And at least in the US, we have all three of the major credit bureaus are paying more attention to this data. One is feeding it into their main credit files. The other two are not. They're segregating the information. Which one is feeding it in? Equifax has announced that it will do that, and it's wow. published some um, some studies about potential inclusion benefits. But as I say, I think a lot of it depends on exactly how things are getting reported, as to what kind of effects it can have. Right now, TransUnion and Experian are both saying that they will collect the information, but it's held separate from their main files. Lenders can request it, but there's just a lot of, of moving pieces right now in, okay. in the entire system as people learn how to adjust. Um, these are different than more traditional longer term credit products in some ways and the system just has not really caught up here yet. So. I mean it's you know what I find interesting is that you know some a lot of the algorithms that are used to create a credit score using the information that's found in a credit report almost certainly are not looking at those products buy now pay later products as individual products they may you know, they may, you know, the algorithm may quote, see the buy now, pay later service either as, and you pointed this out as an, a type of installment loan, like maybe a car loan, or it might see it as a line of credit as a, almost as you would like, a, you know, a credit card. And right. to the degree in which it gets weighted in the algorithm, I mean, the algorithms are right. basically, they're not transparent. They're pretty, I mean, they're pretty hard to get wrap around your, your head, how you're going to get a credit score. But there's some, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sort of, in my mind, uh, a lot of question marks. Uh, yeah, in that so yeah. there are a lot of nuanced details that really can make a difference here, and I think they're still getting sorted out. The one last thing I'll say really quickly and then I'll pass the mic is that um, there are some surveys suggesting that the, the level of delinquency is pretty high in this segment, um, and so yeah. that's another concern, and that goes back to the negative side of this, which is, um, you know, if consumers aren't recognizing it and there are a lot of delinquencies, then, you know, again, potentially there are, there are effects here, and I think right now there may Maybe a perception among many consumers that this just doesn't really affect reports and scores oh, right. for better or for worse. And the, the reality is that it could be quite a bit more complicated than that. And I think catching up awareness about that is really important. Okay. Well, thank you, Kelly. That's an extremely insightful, detailed, and entirely confusing. And, and for more, for more on that, I see Alan has been nodding his head, uh, particularly about delinquent payments. Um, is this a problem in Australia, delinquent payments? And t tell us a little bit about what's going on on the other side of the world, uh, uh, the home of Buy Now, Pay Later. <laughs> it's not a title that we're proud of, Lisa. Um, look, I think it's useful to explain, particularly for people uh, watching from countries where this hasn't started as a service or it's, it's newer in its evolution. It, it's worth explaining where we're at in Australia. Buy now, pay later is now ubiquitous. So wherever you go online to buy anything, I, at least one buy now, pay later service will be presented as a payment option. It'll be there somewhere alongside credit cards, things like PayPal. Um, it's positioned as being equivalent to those. Um, if you walk into a, a retail store, a department store, there'll be buy now, pay later signs all over the um, counter and you're encouraged to use it to pay on your mobile device. Um, big sort of pop-up signs in stores as wow. well, advertising it. Um, we have Afterpay Day, which is a, a giant online sort of promotional day that encourages people to go out and use Afterpay to, to buy things that they might not have otherwise bought. So it's big. Um, wow. And while it's, it started out being positioned as something that was a sort of a convenience thing for young people, like, you know, buy that pair of jeans a bit earlier than you might otherwise and pay it off a few days later. Um, now it's actually available for quite large purchases. So you can lend up to... $30,000 Australian, which is about $20,000 US to put solar panels on your home or to have cosmetic surgery or dental surgery. Um, so um, we've got these two things happening. At, at the other end of the market, 
you've then got it being used for essential services, so groceries, utility bills, energy bills, water bills. Um, and I think um, to understand why this happens, you've got to understand the business model. Um, for businesses, for merchants, it's really attractive because what it does is drive up sales. Um, they, they sell more products if they offer buy now, pay later. And that is because people are buying things because, before they can afford to buy them. That's the business model, but that's, that, that's what makes it good for business. That's what creates risk for consumers. And what we're now seeing in Australia is people um, increasingly in trouble who've got multiple buy now, pay later debt. So it's not that they've had one that's, you know, they've been late on, it's the, the fact they've had five or six or seven. Um, and then um, when they um, miss a payment, they get a late fee, um, they then end up in greater financial trouble. So um, we know from our research of those that in the last 12 months um, missed a payment or had to pay a late fee as a result of that, 89% ended up in deep, deeper financial troubles. So they had to take out another loan in order to repay their buy now, pay later or to pay oh, the late wow. fees or they had to skip um, paying for an essential item like groceries. So we just have this sort of downward spiral of debt. And I would say it's our findings are roughly similar to yours from Consumer Reports, Lisa, in that it's around 15% of people in our case um, who, who had some sort of trouble in the last 12 months. But I think the point about it is they're the ones that have had trouble in the last 12 months. Anybody in the other 85% could fall into financial trouble tomorrow because right. they've got some large unexpected expense or they lose a job and rapidly this turns into a problem. So um, we just see it as being a growing, a growing risk for a growing proportion of the population. And similar to what Chris said about the UK, the problem is that it's not treated like a debt, which means that people don't have the same pr protections they would have if they'd lent money through a personal loan or a credit card. Okay, so we're going to mash up a couple of questions here, and you know, and one of them is about regulatory issues. So since I've got you still here, I'm gonna. My next question goes right for you, right into. I mean, how can how can Australian regulators clamp down on this, and 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 particularly, you know, when you think about um, the global consumer statement, and you know, does does that statement get at some of these issues? Does it give us a little bit of a a nudge? Yeah, we. I might actually just ask. Thea to briefly put the slide up, which has the key points from our global consumer Great. statement. Um, but the, the first one of those, as it comes up, is really the crux of it. And it says, let's just treat buy now, pay later like any other credit product. As consumer advocates, we've spent decades fighting to have good protections um, in most countries um, that apply if you borrow money from a bank, if you take out a payday loan, if you get a credit card. Um, now, when buy now, pay later is essentially doing the same thing, it's lending money to people, they have to pay more if they don't pay it back on time, the amounts are growing, it, it just does not make sense that it's not regulated in the same way. So that's our most important call. And then there are a few other things that flow from that in most countries that are picked up in some of the other points here. So. Um, the third point is that, that um, the people lending you the money should assess the, whether it's suitable or affordable for you. Yeah. And are you yeah. going to be able to afford to pay it back? Um, that would flow from treating it like credit in most countries. And you should have access to redress. Again, that's the second last stop point, but that's something that you would have in most countries if it was treated, treated like other debt. Okay. Um, so so that's, that's the fundamental part of it. But we also want to see... Um, see changes that would mean it's not presented as a default but in fact the default when you're going to buy something particularly online is you you get to pay in full rather than being nudged to use buy now pay later and we want to ensure i know you've got an interest in in how data is used lisa as a lot of us do we want to prohibit marketing um to vulnerable people because one of one of the things we are seeing in australia is that um it's very easy for um, buy now, pay later providers to um, detect online people who are already in financial trouble because maybe they've searched for a payday loan. Those people are now being um, marketed. They're getting ad online ads for buy now, pay later services to encourage them to sign up for more debt. And we want, we want to ban those sort of predatory practices that are really just um, targeting vulnerable people and trying to get them into deeper hardship. Okay, that's this is this is excellent to know. Kelly, I'm coming back to you, but, but we're going to, we're going to, before I do that, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, does the, does the global consumer statement resonate for you in the UK? Does it do all, does it hit on all cylinders or what else is needed? Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it definitely does. And I think 
in terms of what I outlined briefly, in terms of where the review got to, where the government's consulting in the UK on, on, the, on the package of regulation, I mean, effectively, it hits, I think, the points we're talking about here. So by bringing uh, buy now, pay later within the regulatory, so what's called the regulatory perimeter in the UK, but by bringing it within that regulatory perimeter, you will have rules around affordability. You will have rules around what's called in the UK financial promotion. So in other words, how that credit's presented, how it's marketed, do you target particular groups? It will bring it within the scope of uh, the FCA's vulnerability guidance and, and so on and so forth. So I think a lot of the measures that you're, you're talking about here, from a UK perspective, you would see um, you know, regulation applied to this sector in the way that the Treasury is consulted on. If it's done in that way, then that would that would hit a lot of these measures. Um, and I think I think you know there are some countries that have gone in a slightly different direction. Um, so the number of European countries, for example, that really do genuinely prevent anything other than a debit card being sort of put up as the first kind of payment option. I mean, I think and even credit cards are sort of a click through from there. Um, I don't think you know the UK will go that far um, in any sort of sense of that. But but I do think that that overall bringing uh, buy now, pay later within that regulatory framework does begin to solve an awful lot of the problems that are being identified. And, a, and a, one point that I think is often sort of not quite in this debate, I mean, I think if, if the firms themselves want to have a long-term sustainable future, then, you know, being within that regulatory construct, I think is important as well. Um, and that was a point that we made in the review. Okay. Well, those are those are two fantastic perspectives, and I'm moving on a little bit to you, Kelly, because we're going to talk about one issue that is, for me, and maybe I missed it, but it's not as clear in the statement, and that is, you know, the reporting process on onto consumer credit reports, yeah. and um, you know, if you can talk a little bit about how, I mean, how do we get at that aspect of it? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of things there, and it's not all necessarily regulatory. Some of this is about an industry practice as well in this space. Um, I think the biggest question initially is just transparency. Um, you know, to the extent that, uh, that a particular by now pay later provider's practices are buried in terms and conditions, it's just, it's not something the consumer may see. And so I think getting at that question and making, really focusing on ways to educate so the consumer understands, as we talked about, there's, you know, there's potential risk um, in making sure that they do understand the risk of, of negative, the consequences of, of missing payments. Um, and to the extent that consumers are interested in using it as a, a as a kind of building product, like you know, understanding whether the particular provider's practices are going to lead in that direction is, you know, is complicated the question to tackle. So you know, those are important things. And then the other thing I think is really important is standardization. Like I said, with regard to practices and thinking more broadly about how does this compare to other products, um, and and kind of where does it fit in the ecosystem? What's the way to kind of structure the report? reporting in a way that that makes sense and is capturing kind of the key signals for for the system um, you know in the US that's largely an industry driven practice uh, um, you know um, process to, to kind of standardize it doesn't necessarily have to be dictated by regulators but the importance is is that it, it get addressed and that um, to the extent this information is starting to come into the system that it is being identified as by now pay letter and that you know like I said people are starting to to deal with it in a way that really yields the the right kinds of insights as opposed to just muddying the the signal um, is is really important so those are both important considerations. Um, in the U.S., the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is um, is kind of opened an inquiry into this space. They're focusing on a lot of the same issues. One other interesting thing that they raised is questions about um, data harvesting by buy now pay later uh, uh, companies and kind of what they do with their data. Do they ever turn it over to third parties? That's not exactly about credit reporting, but I think it's an other, another interesting question to explore in this space as, as people move forward. So. And, and is the answer yes? <laughs> if it's de identified, possibly? I mean, it's not, you know, that's kind of the name of the game a lot of times uh, with these kinds of financial services. 
I, I mean, I don't have the best. Or we don't know yet. <laughs> I don't have the best line of sight, and they are, I think the comment period closes next week on this, so, yeah. you know, we'll be learning more. They've also sent out inquiries to several specific providers to get more information. Um, I think what it is sort of probing is whether somehow data harvesting could become a third revenue source is kind of what I'm reading between the lines of the questions, but, um, but we don't have the answers yet. Uh, and so I think it'll be a really interesting uh, to see where that inquiry goes and, and what the CFPB comes back out with um, from all the, the data that it's gathering. So. And, and for sure, I mean, this gets into the marketing issue that both Alan and Chris have pointed out and that the, the statement does get at is, you know, as you collect data on your users and then you're, you're more, you know, we, we know that with credit score apps, like this is an area we covered quite a bit, um, you know, you can more effectively market more specific, you know, ever, ever more specific products to consumers that they may or may not, you know, may or may not be in their best interest, but um, boy, they sure know, they can know an awful lot about you. So that's a, that's a, it sounds like a sort of an issue on the horizon that is extremely important, but not as pressing as some of the really immediate financial uh, concerns. Um, I wanna do a last sort of round of questions here. Um, you know, and, and the, the, like the big one on my mind, and is we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about consumer advocates and what they can do, but the thing that is really striking to me is that these products are, you know, five, you know, in some cases, five or six years old. I mean, the concept is not completely, you know, it's not completely brand new, although it's a hot topic. Um, I'm finding that, and I'm, I'm really surprised to understand how sort of overall very little regulation there is uh, that these companies really operate under in, in all cases, in all continents that, that we have touched on today, Australia, uh, UK, and uh, countries and continents, I should say, <laughs> in the United States. And, you know, as we get into the idea of like, well, what can consumer advocates do? Um, I think it's clear there's a pressing need, but it's also clear to me that, you know, it could be slow. I mean, can consumer advocates help speed up this process? Is there something that advocates can do to really move this along so that it doesn't take yet another six years uh, to regulate them? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to Alan uh, and ask, ask that for Australia and any, anywhere else. <laughs> well, I think the most powerful thing we can do, which indeed many of us are doing today by taking this global statement to our national media is to um, shine a light on this issue. Um, I think one of the things we found over the last 12 or 18 months in Australia is that journalists are increasingly sort of thinking about buy now, pay later in a different way. So I think it's sort of, the PR launch around buy now, pay later has been really, really successful. It's sort of seen as being an effective competitor to credit cards, which it is, to be honest. Like, we don't love credit cards either, and we'd love to see more options for consumers, but they need to have the right protections. That's the key problem that we have with buy now, pay later. And so um, the sort of work we're doing to release research like Consumer Reports has um, using um, advocacy like that today, just to try and reframe the debate. Um, and and certainly um, the one of the most powerful things we've found talking to politicians and the media has been just what I said earlier, like, you know, this isn't just now something that's about, you know, um, a few hundred dollars for a pair of jeans. Maybe it is actually something that people are using for really major purchases and they don't have um, the sort of protections that they should. So I think that's an important part of it. But I also think this global collaboration through Consumers International is really, really critical because, um, you know, most of the major players in Buy Now, Pay Later are now operating at a global level. And we really want to have a conversation with them because, as I said, I don't actually have a fundamental problem with Buy Now, Pay Later. I just want it to be provided on terms that are fair for consumers. And if there are Buy Now, Pay Later providers out there that want to have that conversation with us, then we're really up for it. Okay, that's that's terrific, and that's terrific to hear. I, you know, it's it's it, as you're talking, I'm thinking of the sort of paradoxical nature of all of a sudden, sometimes buy now, pay later can actually look like it can make credit cards look like a better service from a consumer protection standpoint, which many many of y'all have spent decades in that space trying to you know strengthen the protections um, for credit cards and consumers, and now all of a sudden. You know, it's hard for me to kind of wrap my head around. Um, and and you know, and kind of moving moving to Chris and thinking about the UK. I mean, what you know, I mean, it's, I have really two questions. I mean, what what regulations would be needed then to sort of bring you know the the global consumer statement to life in the UK? But you know, what can consumer advocates do to help speed up this process so that it doesn't doesn't take so long? <laughs> 
Yeah, so, so I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I think in terms of the overall package of rules, I mean, I've spoken about them a couple of times now. And and I think, you know, if they are enacted, which it looks like the Treasury will go there and give the FCA the necessary powers, then I think, you know, that provides a framework which really will sort of put the industry on a on a regulated footing, on a much more stable footing and a, and a much better set of outcomes for consumers. I mean, I think the other thing, though, to think about from a certainly from an advocacy point of view is that quite a lot of things can be done now without waiting for regulation so firms can improve their own terms and conditions um, there are things that are going on in the market where I think some of that is already beginning to happen to a degree it's also the case certainly in the UK that the regulators do have some powers and indeed the FCA has already used them just under general consumer law so not specific regulation to for example to try and deal with the fact that the contracts uh, a number of the providers have got in the market aren't very clear so so to try and clean that up at least so so there's a range of things going on that i think are beginning to shift the industry i think there's also a degree to which if you're a large player here there is uh, both in terms of preparing to be regulated but also in terms of wider reputation there is a genuine benefit to trying to sort of lean into some of this as it's beginning to happen rather than wait until the very last minute. And again, I think around some of the questions of affordability, you will see maybe some of the players in the market begin to move in that way a bit more. But 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 on the whole, I mean, I think what you've got to have is a level playing field. And the only way in to get that level playing field is, is, is regulation that applies to everyone. Excellent. Well, you know, my our, our real last question is, is we're going to flip it, even though you know, it seems like you might be repeating something. Sometimes it's nice to say it in the positive. So I'm going to ask each of you uh, if you could outline for me. I'm going to start with Kelly. Kelly, can you outline for me what, you know, in your in your wish world, do you wish buy now, pay later services look like? What, what do they look like for you? Like I said, we've been focused fairly narrowly in the space of the reporting side rather than product structure or something like that. So I don't feel like I can speak to that so much. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, getting to a system where we really do know kind of a consistent way to handle this information when it's into the system and so that it can be evaluated in, in a kind of thoughtful way. And, you know, to the extent that people are, are kind of making an argument that it can be a credit building path, that that is really actualized is, yeah. is I think, really important. And, and so, you know, that's the, the space that I think we're looking to see kind of how this comes together and it and it's going to take multiple players to do it it's not just about the providers i think it's you know the anytime you're dealing with a reporting or scoring system you know there are a lot of people in in the ecosystem that have to come together so it's going to take some effort but i think that that uh you know that potentially it would be really helpful and and it's really important to the extent that people are now starting to make arguments about it as as a building path I do have one quick question that is off script, but I think it is pertinent to what you're talking about. And we, when we think about, you know, asking buy now, pay later services to operate more like a credit card in terms of the checks uh, that would need to go, you know, need to happen before a person, uh, you know, is granted the, the service. Um, when we think about, you know, a soft check versus a hard check, right? And that, you know, for those outside the U.S., you know, a hard check um, on a credit report can cost you a couple of points and it can take a couple of years, at least two years to get it off of the credit report. And a lot of times credit card companies will use them um, when, they're, when you're actually applying uh, for a credit card. So how do we, I mean, in just like 30 seconds, you tell us, you know, you don't want the consumers to be dinged for using buy now, pay later services for, you know, purchase of a, you know, a burrito or a Starbucks right. or a mattress. And this is, I mean, they're not all the same, but if, you know, we, we we want, to, we want to be mindful that we don't want to chip away at that score uh, by checking every time. So how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the most important thing is to be clear about it so that people understand what the consequences are. My understanding in the U.S. in particular is that hard checks are extremely rare. I think I've seen it more okay. in conjunction with other countries than, than here. So I, I'm not sure that there is a major problem in, in the U.S. specifically on this. I think the importance is, you know, kind of thinking through the broader set of questions and making sure that it's appropriate. I mean, there are ways in which thinking of this as an open-end credit product where you have an ongoing relationship with a provider that extends over multiple purchases conceptually makes a lot of sense 
to me, you know, and I think that it would lead to kind of a longer trade line that was is potentially more insightful as opposed to trading each purchase as yeah. separate. So, you know, I think there are ways in which thinking about this possibly that may make sense, but, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of nuance in the details and it needs to be thought through. So. Well, I think, I think you just laid out your, your vision for a, an actual buy now pay later service. <laughs> so as I, I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> and so Alan, maybe, maybe you could, you know, flip the script here and tell us, I know you've talked a lot about the things that are needed to shore up for consumer protections, but you know what does the ideal buy now pay later service look like in Australia? Well, first, in a market sense, I think it's useful to have buy now pay later providers in the market for all the reasons we've talked about a moment ago. We don't love the other forms of credit that are there. Ultimately, if there's competition, effective competition between different payment options that should overall create better outcomes for consumers. But competition has to be paired with consumer protection. So. I think that means that for buy now, pay later providers to be in the market, but offering the similar sorts of protections to be checking whether people can afford um, to take out a loan um, before it's offered to them, making sure that the product that's being offered is suitable to them, ensuring they've got access to redress, whether that's um, access to a financial ombudsman or a tribunal in the relevant country, um, similar to what you'd have for a loan. And that you've got payment protections like you have with, with options like credit cards. So if you pay for something and it's not provided or it's not uh, what you were promised, then you've got the right to a refund. Uh, those are really important protections that actually make the whole market work more effectively. And I think that will ultimately be in the interest of buy now, pay later providers. Because one perspective we haven't brought in yet today is what we're actually seeing at the moment is the investor confidence in buy now, pay later um, products um, or companies um, falling through the floor. So um, there's actually increased concern by investors around the world about defaults. Um, so I think it's in the interest, and that's sending their share prices down. So I wow. think it's in the interest of buy now, pay later providers to be addressing these issues. That will make their business models more sustainable and produce better outcomes for consumers. You know, Alan, that is a, that is a terrific indice to point out. I think, and you know, our, I mean, we we're we're very, you know, obviously in this conversation, very focused on the consumer side and what the consumer is experiencing and the protections, rights, and you know, and rights around um, using these products. But you know, to look at that, it's a, it's an indicator of future financial health and it is a very interesting it's a very interesting point uh, to bring up that you know investors are like a little worried about their, and they're a little worried about a couple of different things one of them being obviously defaults and then the other being you know right I mean and you're sort of saying you know well regulations would actually help investors gain confidence um, but you know in the absence of that uh, it sounds like they're they're a little scared so that's that's very interesting thank you for for sharing that um Christopher, you want to talk a little bit about uh, flipping the script here. What does the ideal buy now, pay later service look like for you? Yeah, so so I mean, I agree an awful lot with that, what Alan's just said. Actually, I mean, I think we need to make sure we don't sort of demonize this as a as a, as a product because you know, for many people, the ability to buy something in interest free installments yeah. and the retailer who ultimately is sort of marketing that product really sort of bears the cost that's actually quite a positive product compared to many of the others that we see in the market. If, critically if, you had the same kinds of protections around that for when things go wrong, or also to make sure that, you know, people who shouldn't be able to get access to this credit because it's unaffordable, don't, don't get it extended to them. I mean, it will need, I think, some fairly big pieces of infrastructure to change. I mean, the point that was being made about how credit referencing works today versus how it's going to need to work in the future. But I think also we shouldn't get too confused here. I mean, most of the firms we're talking about, the first time you apply, don't just create an account with that pair of jeans or that pair of sneakers on it or whatever it might be. They're usually saying, here's a two, 300 pound limit that I know exists, you as the consumer don't know exists. So, so actually the differences between say a credit card and how credit bureaus deal with that and how buy now pay later operates behind the scenes actually are not too too dissimilar in many ways so there's ways of solving this particular problem i mean i think also the degree to which for those small scale purchases people are drawing on open banking where that exists in certain jurisdictions to actually get some better data behind some of those lending decisions you know all of those things could work here quite seamlessly i mean i think the the, the great appeal to consumers is this is a very very uh, easy product to operate and use. I mean, some would argue too easy, but 
then actually I think regulation will obviously introduce a little bit of friction here, but actually there are some really smart ways this industry could sort of still work in the future. And then I think finally you get this theme across all sorts of credit now, I think certainly within the UK market, the way the regulator looks at it, it's credit being used appropriately. So what's the product intended to do? Is it being used appropriately in those circumstances? And I think, you know, some of the examples that we can see from other parts of the world, some of the things that Alan talked about, of you know, it now being widely used, for example, in uh, the hospitality sector. So, you know, you can go and buy a meal, go and buy some drinks, whatever it might be, using buy now, pay later. We're not seeing that in the UK market. We're not seeing that in most of the European market, I don't think. And I suspect if for, the, for its long-term future, that's not necessarily a place it wants to go either, I think, as an industry, because of that confidence of investors question. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, that's extremely interesting. Thank you. And, I, and I, I appreciate breaking down the different types of purchases consumers might be making. Um, I wanted to turn our attention to some of the uh, attendees' questions. And I'm, I'm looking at one that is, is, and I'm hoping everybody can just kind of touch on this topic a little bit about disclosures and these sort of, uh, you know, click, you know, quick click, past as you, you know, as a, as a consumer is being faced with the option of, you know, they're going to use any, any of the multiple buy now, pay later services and, you know, how this information, things that, things that are meant for consumers protection actually wind up as convoluted or very difficult to read or, or mm. grasp, you know, agreements. Um, I, you know, if Ken, I don't know, I don't, if Ken wants to maybe unmute and ask a very, you know, specific question about that, I, I would welcome it. Um, but I, I, I like this idea of, you know, what, what are some of those, what, that moment of decision, what do we want a consumer to be faced with? If Hello, Ken sense. Whitehurst here, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Ken, yeah. Um, you know, what's, what's really um, struck me uh, as we're, you know, looking at all the so-called digital service offerings, as we keep buying, drinking the Kool-Aid, that these are a some kind of single product. Somebody puts a name on them, and they think that's a product. And I just don't think that's true at all. Um, you know, I put the comment in that the contract is in the code. Uh, I can remember um, at a conference here um, um, uh, that included a lot of um, even higher court judges here, you know, I asked them how many of them could read computer code since most of the contracts are embedded in computer code now. Um, and of course there was a lot of laughter across the room. So uh, y even they are making decisions based not on the facts, but on what people tell them in oral descriptions are the facts. Um, so th this is a fundamental problem and and um, there's a fundamental difference between credit card and many of these quick click through credit products. The credit card is at least, uh, you know, a prearranged credit arrangement and, uh, and something about the person's ability to pay is included. Uh, it's kind of passing strange to countries that were affected by what happened um, in the United States over the, uh, over the mortgage crisis that, you know, that the U.S. hasn't come to grips with the idea that um, that the old um, chestnut that consumers have that no one will lend you money that you can't pay back is just no longer true, because the financial services industry has learned how to manage and make money off risk, and they um, and so the, it's really a question of when do you get your return that's adequate and then you don't really care what wreckage you leave behind and what wreckage you I mean, can sell. So can 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 I can I ask you? Uh, I, mean, I don't mean to cut you off, but since we only have a few minutes, I would love yeah. you've got a really rich amount of information here. Can you summarize it into like a question that that they might our panelists might be able to like delve right into? Because it's you, like I said, you've got good good in, intel here, um, and I think that you know, I was trying to do that by saying, you know, what is the what does that moment of consumer choice look like? Would you say that's a fair way to ask the question? Well. Um, I, I think the question is um, that I have is why aren't we um, uh, recognizing the difference between the use of revolving credit and, and what is essentially a new credit application 
And why aren't we applying the requirements that normally go with a credit application um, right at the front end of these things? Because they, 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 they each and every transaction is a unique credit application. That's perfect. Can I see? I see Alan shaking his head. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let Alan take that, and then I'm gonna jump to Kelly because that, that's in Kelly's wheelhouse too. So go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I think I think that's broadly you, similar. That's broadly similar, Ken, to what Chris and I were effectively saying. Let's you know take some of the learnings from other types of credit. Um, I thought I'd share with you something. A, a financial journalist for our major financial newspaper paper in Australia wrote this week. The last time bad debts were this bad, Hollywood made a movie about it. Now he was talking about buy now, pay later. Um, and he was talking about the big short short in terms of the whole Hollywood movie, right. essentially saying, look, we're seeing something really similar to the early stages of the subprime lending crisis. Why aren't we recognizing those signs? Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. Thank you. Kelly, do you want to do you want to take on? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's important questions about kind of how the, the process starts and what you know we know that by now paid later um, some companies will start with a small amount and and kind of uh, do a small initial approval and then build over time so a lot of the data that they're building on is kind of their own past payment history with the same consumer so the question is how do you bridge into that and what are the upfront requirements and and you know that's not an illogical way to get a sense of what the consumer can afford but there are really important questions embedded in that i do think the point that you were making is is also really important lisa which is at the moment that the the origination starts the relationship is established especially if the consumer is in the store but even online you know it you cannot get all of the relevant information for the consumer into that moment. And I think that's one of the things that we are seeing. Um, we've done a lot of work, for instance, with cash flow and bank account data. And it's a similar thing because the consumer is focused on the, the loan or the transaction. And there are all of these consequences around that loan or transaction that you also want to educate them about. And it is so difficult. And I think that um, really being thoughtful and designing for, you know, small screens and, you know, all of those kinds of things have to go into it because we know it is so easy from the consumer side to become overwhelmed that they aren't just getting the, the most important um, segments in the, in the moment where they can absorb them. So I think it's tricky both in terms of the, the underwriting and the, the approval process and the consumer education process that goes with it. Um, I'm going to give a homework assignment here really quickly to any of the panelists who would like to look at in the Q&A, Juan has asked us a quite a detailed, very rich question. And as any, any of the three of you are reading through that and maybe thinking ab about how to respond, um, let's do a quick round robin on the demographics. Um, I can say that at least in the United States, you know, for the people that use buy now, pay later products seem to fall into two buckets. And the first bucket is people like myself, but mostly, uh, you know, middle-aged women uh, who are maybe like, although I'm not slightly overextended in my credit, but that is typically um, the, the primary user. And then people, younger people who don't have a lot of credit and who don't really have a lot of means and they, they seek these products out. Um, Alan and, and jump in Kelly, if you, if you know any more for the US, Alan and Chris, let's, we'd love to hear from you quickly. Um, what's going on? Just in briefly. In yeah, briefly, young people have really led the charge um, and they were the, the initial target market. Um, and many of them are using these products without falling into into trouble. I guess the issue is if there's some event in their life, then then they don't they won't have the protections or, that they need if they then land in trouble. Um, but then building off that base of young people, it is now ubiquitous. So it is increasingly just everyday people, pe parents um, trying to manage their household bills in, in the context of rising cost of living, and that's where we're seeing further problems. Great, thank you, Alan, Christopher. Yeah, I mean, again, very, very similar um, set of experiences. So this is a product that tends to trend younger. It trends slightly more towards women than, than men. Uh, but as Alan said, you know, you now see this being deployed across a whole range of demographics. Uh, buy now, pay later associated with, you know, premium brands, um, you know, quite expensive items um, uh, that, you know, definitely gain more at a sort of what you might call a middle class kind of market. Um, so, so, you know, this, this, is, this is across a whole group of people, but on the whole, there is a trending towards lower income, there is a trending towards younger uh, that you can observe, certainly in the UK. 
Yeah, uh, I would add just real quickly is I think especially to the extent that it does uh, that a lot of the usage is trended towards younger populations, we know that they often um, will not have as thick credit files, they may have, you know, not have credit scores because they're still kind of getting established. And so I think there's some implications there with regard to the credit building questions. And, and if um, younger consumers are really you know, pivoting towards these channels, what are the potential implications for them to, to build credit records for buying a home or doing other things downstream? So. Well, it, we have reached our time. So I cannot thank everyone enough, uh, all of our attendees, as well as our panelists. Juan's question is, is fantastic. If anyone can reach out to Juan individually or vice versa, Juan, if you'd like to reach out to our panelists, I, I encourage that. I will say that I, I do believe uh, Latin American countries would be, this is, this, that's a, would have been wonderful to include uh, a representative uh, from from any of them because I, it sounds like you're sort of in a different um, stage of development, but also a very necessary and important one. So thank you for thank you for raising that. Um, and I will say quickly in closing, uh, I think what is very clear is that the buy now pay later products are very uh, are actually filling a need in the marketplace. It's a, also an indicator of where people are sort of in their personal finances, but as these more and more of these products emerge across the globe, um, greater and greater levels of regulatory effort are gonna be needed. And it's, it's across the, it's in all aspects, I would say of the service um, itself, as well as you know, how they fit into very important existing um, financial regulatory models and credit reports and scoring and, and protections, you know, product, uh, purchase protections, which I think are really important uh, as well for consumers. So I, I can't thank all of you enough. This is definitely not the last time we'll be talking about this topic. Um, certainly, uh, we will be writing more. So thank you so much. And yes, yes, definitely take a look at uh, our everybody's Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram accounts uh, for Consumers International. And thank you so much. Have a lovely evening and a great day ahead of you. Bye-bye.